a team I don't feel we're too high on defense or too, or sorry, that we're too low on defense, even though we have their defense collapsing, is the Arizona Cardinals. That's the other team we want to talk about today. And this is our big – this is the big team that we have lower than conventional wisdom across the entire league, other than Cleveland, which is only lower than conventional wisdom because we're presupposing a season-long suspension for Watson. This is like our big underplay, I think. Um, and mostly it's their offense is rated about what their offense has been rated the last couple of years. I know that that sounds surprising, but the way their offense has collapsed over the last few games of the season, the last couple of years, their offense has been very average for the whole year. It's their defense that we see collapsing, plus the hardest schedule in the league. Although if you remember from yesterday's show, that's dependent on the Watson suspension. If the Watson suspension is only six games, the Cardinals no longer have the hardest schedule in the league. Now the Bengals do. If the Watson suspension is for the entire season, now the Cardinals have the hard schedule. But either way, the Cardinals have a hard schedule. Hard schedule. A lot of great skill position talent that we don't know who's going to be available when. Now we have Marquise Brown facing some problems. We know we're going to be without Nuke Hopkins for six games. And a defense that I don't even know where to begin with. In terms it's of a great coaching job. Like the fact is Vance yeah. Joseph has done an amazing coaching job to coach mm-hmm. these players to a top 10 performance in DVOA over the last couple of years. But first of all, there are some statistical indicators that are negative about their defense. Like the fact that they were very high in takeaways, like the fact that they were very strong in short yardage run runs, which tends to regress pretty heavily from year to year. And then there's the players who left and the, like, just look at the roster. Like, just look at the roster. Tell me that looks like a top 10 defense to you. It does not. Antonio no. Hamilton is a second-year undrafted free agent, and he is a starting quarterback. You have Buda Baker. You have what's left of J.J. Watt, who will give you probably eight or nine really, really good games and lots of, like, uh, dramatic poses. Uh, and then you got a lot of – I mean, you got some guys who can play a little bit, and Marcus Golden can play a little bit. There's some other guys. But just – there's a little bit of a who are these guys for a, a lot of them along the way. And, you know, I, I, I look forward to my weekly what's Isaiah Simmons doing now uh, uh, article that crosses my desk. Like, oh, he's a safety now. He's an edge rusher. Traditional off-ball linebacker. We found the position for him. And I think they'll find – it's going to be a uh, – what do you call it? A, a, a Riddick, Hassan Riddick situation. They will find – the position for him just in time for him to go to free agency and end up someplace else. From what I've read, it's slot corner. But oh. he's covering the slot a lot. So, I mean, uh, maybe. I mean, Byron Murphy fits best in the slot as opposed to outside. So if Simmons is in the slot, that probably bumps Murphy back outside, which I guess when you have Hamilton out there, corner, that may not be the worst thing in the world. But, I mean, last year, like especially after Watt went down, the defense was Chandler Jones, Buda Baker, uh, a couple other guys like Golden and Zach Allen, who had a quietly pretty solid year as an interior defensive lineman. But it's those guys and then Vance Joseph creating chaos. They blitz a ton. Yeah. Uh, they send DBs on the rush a lot more than league average. So, uh, but not necessarily always in the form of sending five or six, though they did that a lot as well. So it's just create as much chaos as they can on the back end to hopefully cover up for some of the deficiencies there. And now you lost Chandler Jones, who I don't know if you can really call him underrated, given that he made the all pro team multiple times in Arizona, but like maybe he gets overshadowed by Aaron Donald being in the same division, but he is an excellent player. If Isaiah yeah. Collins is still a slot corner when he has to face Cooper Cup, Debo, George Kittle in the slot, they're going to destroy him. They're just going to look like we, like we can match up this guy 50 different ways in the division alone. And obliterate and vaporize this young man. He is not a slot corner. You you do not think that is the right way to use Isaiah Simmons, huh? I, 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 and I guess you know if I say, well, he's a will linebacker, and a lot of times there's a similarity of uh, things like that. But it's like the state of mind that says, oh, you know what? Hi, I'm Sean McVay. I'm just going to motion Cooper Cup into the slot and see who's covering him. That's going to be 375 receiving yards in a game. The main thrust of the chapter, or a lot of it, was about whether they should pay Kyler Murray. And after we published the book, they paid Kyler Murray. And Old Heady 403 asks whether the Kyler Murray contract was fitting in our eyes or was he overpaid because $230 million is a lot of money. Uh-huh. I mean, it's kind of the going rate. I mean, yeah. the quarterback market isn't necessarily rational. It's just, okay, this guy's up, therefore he's getting more money unless he's very clearly 
below the other guys that are coming up for that. And when you're in the building, it's not surprising if they're kind of talking themselves into things. Like clearly they have talked themselves into this version of the roster. Like they have James Conner back on a hefty contract. They gave Ertz uh, real money, Zach Ertz. Um, they decided that the guys that they had for the most part, other than Marquise Brown, they wanted to roll with on offense. They just extended DJ Humphreys. So they may feel like he's the guy and that's why he's getting paid that much. To this point in his career, I don't know if he's there, but he is in some good company based on some of the comps that we put together for the book through his first three years. Given all the evidence that they're not 100% sold with him, starting with homework gate, which I'm glad <laughs> happened when I wasn't around. That was weird. That yeah. was weird. Then we have this whole thing with the, okay, Kyler, if you're so good at it, you call plays thing that him and Kingsbury got into on the sideline, which never heard anything like that that was – told to us by the coach like it was some sort of like punishment for the player. Given all of that, the option of just waiting a year and getting another year of him and then seeing or even waiting to October and putting an extension on the table, based on the mindset of the Cardinals, not necessarily my mindset, it would have made sense to do those things and said, hey, you know what? If we have to use the franchise tag in the future or the rookie contract, let's do that made more sense than putting $230 million in front of him when you're simultaneously saying, hey, oh, by the way, could you get a tutor or something like that? It's not – you talk about an irrational market. It's an irrational market, Carl. It's an irrational decision at that point to, to pay the money that you don't seem like you're comfortable paying. The money was supposed to make the drama go away. I mean, my, my basic take on this, and I think we did this on the show when he signed the contract, is, you know, the classic – there's three kind of quarterbacks, the win because of, the win with, and the win despite. And I know that we're projecting the Cardinals to have a losing record, but I still think Kyler Murray is in the win because of tier. He's the lowest guy in that tier, Yes. but he's in that tier. And when you have a guy in that tier, you have to pay him the going rate for quarterbacks because he's a guy who can lift your team to wins. And how many of those guys are there? Like nine or 10. And you've got to pay one if you have them. So I think it was the right move. But you're right. It's weird given the way the Cardinals have treated him and the weird soap opera that's gone on around this guy. It's a win because of quarterback with a win despite head coach in front office, potentially. <laughs> uh, and that might be what we're looking at here. Because I first thought when I saw all of this going on is the guys, Kingsbury and Kime, who both voted themselves new contracts, are suddenly the ones asking for accountability. I want to see some accountability from them. Oh, we're rolling with this roster. Are you? Did you? Is this some crowning success for Steve Kime, this roster? Is this some crowning success for how the culture is being built from Cliff Kingsbury right now that December comes and this team's like, oh my God, New Hopkins isn't here. Let's let's suck. You know, where is you where, where is your sign that you guys are doing things the right way? Blake Murphy is watching. Hello, Blake, uh, who covers the Cardinals and says the Cardinals issue is stemming from the fact they couldn't avoid paying Murray after they had already extended Kingsbury and Kime. And the owner likes each one individually. But do they work together well? And I think that that's the weird question. Part of it is this weird Kingsbury second half decline thing that nobody can figure out why it happened, even though it goes back to Texas Tech. So yeah, it's exactly. not particularly related to the Cardinals. And it, it could just be random chance, right? It, yeah. I don't remember exactly what the whole Wyatt Earp effect def is defined as, but basically it's the idea that if you know if you roll a die six times, eventually you're going to have it show up one six times in a row, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's right. that that's the thing, right? So it's not necessarily – it could just be random chance that all his teams decline in the second half, but – it sure looks like a trend that nobody can figure out. And if it happens this year, when they get Hopkins back, like if they go down after getting Hopkins back, then, then it's a thing. Because that you can't go down after you get Hopkins back after six games. Yeah, I mean, at least last year you could kind of point to the fact that Antoine Wesley, which like, not for lack of trying, but he was being asked to play the DeAndre Hopkins role. And yeah. – uh, Antoine Wesley's not DeAndre Hopkins, you know, like, <laughs> Freaking news. They, I mean, maybe that's on Cliff for not adapting quick enough. Maybe that's on Kyler for not wanting to adjust his own play style, given the fact that his uh, safety blanket, Mr. Hopkins over there, wasn't there last uh, stretch run of the season. But like, 
at a certain point, a few anecdotes kind of become a trend. Yeah. I mean, there are good players here, right? Like it's interesting to see what they'll do with Rondale Moore after his, he actually had more yards after the catch than actual yards last year. <laughs> <laughs> right. When you, when you keep tossing the ball four yards in the backfield, you're going to, um, you're going to have that. We haven't hit the fact that AJ Green is old. And while he did bounce back some last year, he is aging that their offensive line is old. And while I think a guy like a Calvin Beecham, like charting stats show that he's kind of underrated. Mm -hmm. He's old and aging, and a lot of their guys are aging. So I just think there's a lot of Zach Ertz is aging, but there's a lot of questions about this team that I think back up what the stats say, which is that they're the most likely team to sort of fall apart from last year. When I watch the play, like the play designs are, are brilliant. Like I look at these plays and it's like, this is fascinating the way they're doing this, the way they're doing this, really on offense and on defense. And then the results fall apart in December. And sometimes I wonder, is it just that now you've, you know, you've opened up your bag of tricks and every other team is like, oh, here comes the double screen to Rondell Moore and they're sitting on top of it. I don't know what it is, but it's it's still there. It's still prevalent. Cardinals over 9.5 at plus 165. Yeah, I mean, I'm, no. I'm Mr. Pessimism about this team, so no. Okay. Well, this one might be better. Under 7.5 at plus 195. Our simulation probably loves that as a value bet. I mean, if you only got 7.7 mean wins and the line is there for, I mean, that sounds like it's roughly yeah, like one in three. You're going to go under so. at least 40% of the time, and that line is, you know, 33% or better. It's, yeah, it's a good value. There are a lot of married bets, prop bets, where people want to look at them because a lot of them are like 3,599 rushing yards and 400. I don't like doing them on the podcast because it takes five minutes to say them. But if you're interested in fantasy-type prop bets, there are a lot of them about the Cardinals, and you might find one you like. A.J. Green is a little underrated by ADP, according to our projections, because while he is aging, he's going to get his – like, I realize there's not a lot of upside there, but if you want, like, a steady guy who can fill in in bye weeks and stuff, like, you can do a lot worse than A.J. Green this year. Good pass to Matthew. Gets it. Cut. Still first down into the secondary. Aaron Donald cannot be stopped. 